we go on to our next presentation. He's coming from the United States. <laughs> and uh, it's Mr. Dominic Terzi. May I introduce him to you? The floor is yours, Dominic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? More importantly, can our outstanding verbatim reporters hear me? Are they doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job? That wasn't going to be straight for no answer. Truly, I wanted to thank you very much. I've been observing yesterday and today, and you are both. Unbelievable. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been reporting in the United States for a very long time. I'm not going to tell you that it's in excess of 50 years. That would be the truth. But I want you to know I have enjoyed my every moment, every word that I've written. I have worked in the state court system. I'm now working in the United States federal court system. I've worked in the private sector. I've owned a school. I've taught. I've lectured. I do all kinds of things because I get bored easily. But here I am. And I want you to know that truly, I truly mean this. I am honored to be here speaking to some of the world's finest writers, some of the world's finest speech to text capturers. That truly is a honor that I didn't expect to have. And thank you very much, Pasto. I thank you for inviting me. Today, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, if we can get, and we do have our slide presentation working, I can't believe it. Now, I have to apologize because most of these slides were done by me. They were created by me. Now, when we get to the time of the Sumerians, I want you to know I did not take those photographs personally. I just want to share that with you. I'm not quite that old. But I did want to let you know that what I'm about to do is tell you a story. It's a story that begins about 5,000 years ago. I'm going to tell that to you in 30 minutes. That in itself is a feat. But it was at a time of a civilization which many people feel was the most intelligent ever to set foot on planet Earth, the Sumerians. It was a time when they came to a realization that any thought that's important should be preserved. And what did they do? 3500 BC, they set out to create what was not before then in existence, a systematic way of writing and reading the thoughts that they determined to be important. It took them some 400 years to compile some 2,000 word and pictograph systems of writing called cuneiform. And about a similar time, over in Egypt, they came to a similar realization. And in their case, they decided that hieroglyphics were far too complex. And they used the hieroglyphics to develop more cursive forms of writing, demonic and periodic script, particularly. And that's the way they preserved important thought. And so that is the beginning of the story that I'm about to tell you. But there's something that comes before that. Because I want to also be a little bit entertaining. Now, I'm not going to sing. I promise I will not do that. <laughs> Although Rian said that I, no, he didn't say that I should. I work in a federal courthouse. In the United States, we do have this federal court system. And one day, a few years ago, somebody in the court system, the department that runs the federal court buildings, came to me and said, we know that you have a couple of steno machines. How would you like to display them? And it took me a fraction of a second to yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, of course, I accepted the offer. And then began this concept of how am I going to display them? What story will I tell? Because if it's a nice story, 
This can be something that lingers and can make people in my profession proud. And so I work pretty hard to put together what I believe is a pretty good story. This is the result of it. It became known as the Gallery of Shorthand. They gave me an area in the building on the first floor inside the main entrance of a federal courthouse that everyone who walks into the building must see and pass. And understand this, the whole building is white. Everything in the building is white, except for the gallery. I like red, I love red. <laughs> At John Wimplowski, we had a whole conversation about that. And so, I put together color. I put together a variety of things, because I know that not only court reporters are going to walk through this building, lawyers, witnesses, good guys, bad guys, lots of people will walk through the building, students. I wanted something there for everyone. That's what it became. Where I'm located is in the Northeast United States. This is a blow up re re representation of where I'm located. New York City is at the bottom of that arrow. Long Island is that orange strip to the right. I'm about a third of the way into Long Island. That's where my building is located. When I told the chief judge of my federal court that I was going to be here in Belgium at the Interstellar Conference and told her the significance of this, she asked if I would share this with you. Her words, we are so pleased to host the Gallery of Shorthand in the Eastern District's Central Islip Courthouse. The gallery pays tribute to the important work of shorthand reporters without whom the judicial system could not function. Members of the judiciary, litigants, the press, and the public all depend upon court reporters for a record of court proceedings. Access to an accurate and complete record is crucial for attorneys in preparing arguments for appeal and their clients whose rights may be at stake. We are enormously grateful to our court reporters for ensuring the accuracy of these proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not something that usually we as court reporters hear. We usually hear, thanks a lot, see you tomorrow. <laughs> so this is kind of cool and I want to share that with you. This is the building in which I work. It's about 40 miles. I figured that out about 64 kilometers, so we don't do that in the United States. I, I, okay? You, you, I, think I wanted you to relate to it. Uh, east of New York City. That is the building, as I say, on the right, that rotunda is the main entrance. At the bottom of that are the doors coming into the building. Now I'm going to show you something on the other side of that. This is the inside of that main entrance. The spot on the left, that is the area they gave me for the gallery. See how white that was? Mm. That was kind of good maybe. <laughs> we needed color. Kind of anyway, that's what was given was offered to me. For that, English, little... that was the design. That was the concept. In fact, I looked all over for somebody to help me. I'm just a court reporter. I don't know how to design a museum. <laughs> so I looked all over and I found somebody who just by telephone was infatuated. He, he could not believe the story that I wanted to tell. He said, I will do the design. And he spent about 15 hours in the United States. Nobody did that for free. <laughs> I don't know about other countries. In the US, ain't gonna happen for free. He did that design. And I thought it was a fabulous one and that's what we implemented. And so that is what it became and we opened it in September of 2010. The concept, the mission, the philosophy of the gallery. If government deliberation is to be remembered, revised, or acted upon, it first must be recorded. And that's the belief of Thomas Jefferson. The affairs of a society, its organizations, and governmental bodies can be scrutinized only when its discussions are first memorialized in an impartial and accurate writing. That timeless truth led to the creation of written language in 3500 BC. Yes, before I became a reporter, but not by that means. <laughs> it compelled Julius Caesar in 59 BC to order that the liberations of the Roman Senate be written. 
and in the United States in 1873, reversing their prior practice of secretive deliberations, the United States Senate hired official reporters to transcribe their debates. And we have something called the Congressional Record of the U.S. That was invented by, started by, a court reporter, Thomas Lloyd. A reporter who wrote tachygraphy, shorthand. Interesting guy, that's a story for another day. <laughs> this is the layout of the gallery, and it's not easy, but I just wanted to give it to you on the left. Everything is around the walls. Not everything, but the, uh, the, the main story. The story that I tell is in epics, because in my research I found that most shorthand historians talked about epics, or important time segments or pivotal segments of time in the history of shorthand. And so I simply adopted that word, epics, not mine. I'm not that smart, but I love saying it, epics. Now, they only came up with four. I'm old, and I'm looking at it from a different perspective, and I have a lot more years in front of me than when they were doing it, so I had a total of 10 epics. So on the left wall, I tell the story of the first four epics. I'll tell you what they are in a few minutes. On the far wall, I'll show you a closer version of that, are the second four epics, or the uh, five to eight, epics five to eight, and that's a closer view of what it looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. When I tell the story, I use lots of artifacts. I've collected many books over the course of a number of years. My oldest book was back to, a big, I think, in the 1600s, my oldest book on shorthand. But I collect books, I collect stone machines, I collect a variety of things, all out of my own pocket. This is not even the gallery's uh, uh, funds my own pocket that I use. And so that's the uh, four to eight epics. And this is epics nine and 10. You can see the variety of machines. I know it's hard to see them closer. So I've given you a couple of closer versions. We'll be discussing a lot of these machines, showing you close up views of them in just a few minutes. Another view of the machines. <coughs> Epic 10 is meant to convey to the world. Remember, I'm telling the world what you and I pretty much know. Epic 10, my Epic 10, is shorthand in the 21st century. And I define that as instant text from speech. And then I further subdivide that, or further subdefine that, as use in legal type proceedings, captioning or subtitling, and part reporting. So those are my 10 epics. This is a listing of my 10 epics. I'm not going to ask you to memorize them. This is not a test. But I do have some handouts in here. I'll give you a chance to really take them home and take a look at them. Epic 1. In southeast Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, the Sumerians came up with this. Now understand, you and I know the importance of knowledge to making a good record. Many people, most people in my own opinion, outside of our profession, and this has, is not method specific at all. People outside our business think we hear and write. Now I can sp only speak about English, sometimes not too well. But I can tell you that in the English language, we have words such as adapt, adopt, adapt. And if a reporter does not know that there are three similar sounds, remember, not everyone speaks distinctly, at least not in the United States, they don't. Perhaps in other countries, they are very, very good elocutioners, but not in the United States. I can tell you that most people kind of speak into their tongue, into their people. And they mumble a little bit. They talk loud. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, that was a test. That was, I promised Dan I would give the test. Epic 2. Epic 2. Now, this is And so a reporter has to take the sound he believes he hears and up. Again, I'm teaching, preaching to the choir. You all know this. But we have, knowledge becomes very important. The point of saying that is the Sumerians knew that. 3500 BC. They took 12 years to train their scribes. 12 years of knowledge before they would be called an official scribe. But they were 
so smart that they actually became prestigious members of society. Ahmad Mamou, a 45-year career scribe, had a cloister of 140 priestesses, and she was responsible for the scribes who wrote. And if you're not familiar with this term, I can tell you, just remember it and use it with the people who uh, you believe are highly, highly educated. Most people who have studied law or anything familiar with it know about the, the Code of Hammurabi from the, the Babylonian king. Um, those were very, very significant uh, rules uh, during uh, his reign. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the scribes of Egypt had a similar concept. And so they developed quicker forms of writing than hieroglyphics. Those are two examples. They too, their scribes also became respected members of society and rose to high positions. Here's one who became the overseer of all the royal scribes and also of physicians and dentists. I like looking at these, these slides because it reminds me of what I'm supposed to say to you, otherwise I have to look at paper and I to it. Another one. This is a very famous uh, statue. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen this. Um, the son of Hapu, Amenophis. He was one of the most important scribes who spanned several reigns. He was overseer of all projects of the pharaoh, and in particular was responsible for construction of the temples at Luxor. Another, uh, Top was the inventor of writing, the god of wisdom and magic, measurement and regulation of events and time, and scribe of the underworld. I don't know what that means, but it's a great title, and I thought that I'd share that with you. Chinese shorthand. Again, I'm not going into depth with these. We're kind of glossing over them. But I wanted to share with you that on the other side of the world from uh, where a lot of these things were happening, Chinese had a different reason for inventing faster and faster ways of writing. They felt that when somebody was arrested, they wanted to capture a confession as quickly as possible. And so they needed faster and faster ways of writing down what the accused was saying in order that he would sign off on it. And so they developed these quicker and quicker ways of writing. Now, I could refer to my notes and bore you with a lot of things. If I forget things and I'm getting a little old, so once in a while I do, I'll open my book and see what I can remember from there. But in 2007, I had a great opportunity to visit Beijing together with 40 of my colleagues from the United States to meet with our Chinese counterparts. And that was the first time any of us, they gave me the honor because I had a lot of gray hair, to write on the Chinese dental machine, the Yahweh machine. What I hadn't known until I walked into this room was that I was writing in real time. <laughs> and because I'm accustomed to paper, or at least was at that time, I asked for a printout. <laughs> and so the reporter printed out what I had written. I won't say that everybody left for a long time, but they did. I purposely never asked what it was that I had written. But the significance of this and the fact that I found a way of putting an arrow into my PowerPoint, which is not an easy thing for me to do, my age, it's not easy to do these things. But I put an arrow there because the first thing that the reporter did was sign off on the transcript. She signed it. It's kind of a throwback to the reason for the original invention of faster writing in China. The third epic in the gallery is Roman shorthand. Let me first discuss what you're looking at. On the left we see, it's supposed to be Cicero, addressing the Senate. On the insert on the right, the furthermost, uh, the, the person standing furthermost to our right is supposed to be Tiro. In the first instance, writing the words of Cicero. Tiro, we'll talk about the invention of short and Tiro's role, but at this point he is essentially Cicero's reporter. In the second instance, he is reading from his wax tablet shorthand. 
to what I call the premier or transcribing scribes, uh, Scopus, transcribers, if you will, who are now writing in Latin, not in Tyrolean shorthand, what he is reading to them. With me? Is that clear? So he had written it in shorthand, and is now reading from his shorthand the Latin, which they are now running on to parchment. And so, it is because of the transcribers that we know what Cicero had to say. It is because of Tiro and Cicero who invented the shorthand that we were able to capture the words in the first instance. There is nothing that remains, to my knowledge, of Tiro's shorthand from that period of time. It was improved over the course of many centuries. It changed and improved and expanded. But from that time, nothing remained. Why not? Because they took the wax and they melted it and reused it. But of course, the parchment remains. And of course, that's what is of interest to us. That's how we know what happened during that period of time. Am I making anyone fall asleep yet? No. This is a book which doesn't come across very great in this photograph because I took the photograph and I'm not that good. I'm going to ask my son to do it because he's got a great camera and he knows how to do these things. However, I wanted to share this much with you. This book is one of only four in the world. I searched for well over 10 years to find this book. And the reason that I looked for this book is because it contains later iterations of Tyronean shorthand. It is on display in the gallery. I don't tell most visitors at the gallery how valuable it is. But I share that, of course, with you. Because it's open to the page which has, I think, three or four different iterations of Tyronean shorthand. There came a time when shorthand was abolished. Emperor Justinian did, like anybody. But more so with shorthand, he considered cryptography. You know what? I skipped over something. Do you mind if I step a half step back? You see, somebody said no. <laughs> Tyronean shorthand is the name of the shorthand that was invented in Roman times. Many people believe that it was invented by Cicero's slave, Tiro. It was something that I believed until about eight years ago. I stumbled upon a work by Isaac Pittman, of all people, who was also a brilliant historian. And many of you people I know know more about this than I. I'm kind of a newcomer to history of shorthand. But after I came across his articles, I read his books rather, I read other people's books, and it turns out that Cicero himself was the inventor of shorthand, perhaps in conjunction with Tiro, his slave, who was really more like a friend. They came from the same household, northern Italy, I believe. Um, and they went when Cicero decided to perfect his oratorical skills by traveling throughout Greece. He took Tiro with him as kind of a buddy, just a person to bounce ideas off of. And in the course of that, Tiro said, hey, you know what? The Sumerians were great, but I'm much better on my feet. I don't think well and write it. I'm much better when I'm on my feet speaking, and I want somebody to capture the words that I'm saying. And so Cicero developed this system of shorthand, which he named for his slave. And thus it became known as Tyronean shorthand. When they got back to Rome, and Tiro started using shorthand to capture Cicero's words, the other senator said, hey, yeah, we're just as good as this guy Cicero. How about our words? And they spoke to Cicero, and he and Tiro trained a bunch of their slaves. And so was born the first corps of reporters. I just love that expression. Love that. Anyway, I'm sorry I, I skipped that before, but I wanted to share that with you. Am I talking too much? Uh, OK, so. <laughs> so we have the abolition of shorthand, um, and uh, interest was renewed in 1200 AD um, when uh, uh, various artifacts of shorthand, the Tyronean shorthand, were found, and uh, Thomas Beckett started his, well, that was much later, he came a little bit later. But interest was renewed about 1200 AD. Now, I, I wanted to point this out to you. In my gallery, on that left wall, I have a bunch of shadow boxes. 
And, you know, when you talk about the abolition of something, you're talking about a negative. If here I had a very nice shadow box, which was, you know, I'm going to be, how do you express a negative in a shadow box? I had this great big problem, you see. Um, a problem of displaying things. Until I came to the realization that it was the monks during the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the monks were swirled away and in fact encouraged to create writings. And this monk, a very famous monk among artists, Saint Jerome, uh, is depicted in this painting as translating the Hebrew and Greek Bibles into Latin. And so I finally had something to put into my empty shadow box. But it was to depict the fact that monks really were working during those times. That was a close-up of it. I'm going to skip over that and go to Epic 5. Epic 5 talks about the vital 250 years. And the 250 years began with Timothy Bright. He invented the first pivotal system, the system which launched 250 or 60 years of shorthand systems, which ultimately led to the most pivotal systems a little bit later. Um, it was motivated by the need to record parliamentary debates, and uh, it also fueled a tremendous amount of other systems throughout Europe. Uh, I only mentioned a couple of them here. On this slide, I talk about what I refer to as the masters, the early masters of shorthand. You may recognize some of these names, you may not at all. The systems, I love some of the names of the systems, polygraphy, bacrygraphy, swift writing, <coughs> pin plucked from an eagle's wing. That's not only the name of a book, but it's also the name of a system of shorthand. Short writing character read, and the writing schoolmaster. Some of these are really, really wonderful names. And to open the books to read the books and see the inscriptions of the work is just a marvelous, marvelous thing. And I had many of these uh, in the gallery. Then we come to what I call the revolutionary systems of shorthand, the systems of shorthand that are based on phonetics. 24-year-old English teacher by the name of Isaac Pittman who had studied Samuel Taylor's system and used it, devises a system which becomes the most revolutionary system probably in the history of shorthand. And he was a brilliant businessman. He knew that not everyone could afford going to school or buying his books. And so he, you could pass by a newsstand and pick up a magazine very inexpensively to start learning his shorthand. If you couldn't go to school to practice, you could buy a book on another newsstand. He came out with magazines weekly and monthly and quarterly and so forth so that you could practice your skill. And then when this other man, 21-year-old John Robert Gregg comes along, and invents a system which was also good and tries to launch it in London, nothing doing. Pittman and his family had such a stranglehold on that market that John Gregg decided to come to the United States. Now let me just detail for you, which I'm sure you're reading, the names of these systems. Sound hand was what Isaac Pittman first called his system. I don't believe that that book exists anywhere. If so, it's buried in, in some museum somewhere. Um, but when he revised his system and renamed it to phonography, it didn't become known as Pitt and Shorthand until the 1900s. But when he renamed his system as phonography, I happen to have the first edition of that book in the gallery. And that's a neat thing to look at. Very thin, very nice, it's in excellent condition. Uh, that was his system. When John Gregg came along, he called his system light line phonography. But you can see, it was 50 years later, full. And so John Gregg is not getting to first base in London. So what does he do? He comes to America. And where did most Europeans at that time come? Where did they land in America? The Northeast, the New York, Massachusetts areas. 
Well, ah, I'm skipping, well, I don't have it here, but it turns out John Gregg met another wall when he got to the, Zare, to, to, to the Northeast. It turns out that Ben Pittman, Isaac's younger brother, came to New York and he established Pittman shorthand there. And then he moved over to, to Cleveland, I believe, also after that, and established schools and so forth. So he was also stopping Greg from doing anything. Ultimately, John Greg, because his system was really easier to learn and to use, he ultimately uh, went out to the Midwest of the United States, and, and he his became his system rather became the most used system throughout the United States. Am I driving you crazy, John? Isn't that amazing? Hmm. This is unbelievable. Thank you. Um, a little bit about proliferation in Europe. Shorthand spread throughout Europe. The French, the Italians, the Germans, aside from the English, of course, were predominant in uh, developing systems. If I recall correctly, the, the, the largest book on shorthand ever written is still the German book, Gabelsberger. I could be wrong in that, but that's my remembrance. Um, but they were all very, very strong on shorthand systems. Um, in America, America, <coughs> can you hear me? This is not working. That's okay. Uh, in America, there were no new systems of shorthand. I did find one. One. A man named Parkhurst invented a system. Actually, he wrote a book called A Shorthand Book. <laughs> that's all that's known of it, except that it was a very subpar system, to quote the person whose article I read who informed me of that. All the other U.S. systems were adaptations of Pittman, Gregg, and so forth. Sloan de Foy, and all the variety of, of systems that were created in Europe. Another interesting point I'd like to share with you. Thank you so much. Hello. Another interesting thing is that John Gregg, when he was in the early days writing about his own system, said that his system was not meant for the verbatim high-speed writer. It was really for the lower-speed stenographic writers in business offices and so forth. It wasn't until, in the United States, a person named William Gertler successfully competed at, I think it was 260 or 280 words a minute, that John Gregg himself said, mm -hmm, I may have had something better than I thought, and then realized that he did have a system, which was wonderful. Um, I will not spend time talking about individuals in the business, because that will take an awful lot of time. But I can tell you that uh, in the United States, we had people, for example, the uh, secretary to a president, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, was a court reporter using Greg Shorthand. And in case those of you who are not familiar with graphic, this is what graphic shorthand is, is pen shorthand, uh, if you're not familiar with it, I can tell you that at least in the United States, in the early 1900s, so let's say about 1910, in speed contests at 280 words per minute, they were being won with high degrees of accuracy, 99% and better, by Greg and Pittman writers. Machine writers find that hard to believe. I did. I was shocked when I first read that. But in fact, it is true. They were extraordinary. And doesn't it go back to what Interstellar was all about? It's not about the system. It's about the person. And then we come to machine shorthand. Some of the earliest inventors I was able to find, it took me many years to even uncover some of these names. Very little is known about them. In France, someone named Gonard in 1827 was attempting to develop mechanized shorthand. This name, the second name from Germany, is rather common. I've come across this name in several different uh, 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 
research articles. Um, a baron, he, he was uh, kind of a man about town, he did a lot of different things, uh, but he was very, very interesting. He developed, a, he tried to develop a machine, as did Mr. Ghali in 1830. There were others, no idea as to whether their, their machines were viable in 1867 and 1871, both in Italy, Mr. Lamarca and Mr. Imagine. This is something I want to share with you. And by the way, in just a few minutes, we're going to take a short break. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to get through one or two other little things with you. Do you mind? Yeah, fine. <laughs> if American humor doesn't go over too well, my apologies. I'm just trying to make it a little bit light. As I was doing my research, I, I read almost every book that I have. Of course, if it's not in English, I have a lot of tr trouble. But I read, I read almost everything that I own, magazines, periodicals, books, and so forth. And when I was doing research on patents, I read most of the language of most of those. And then I read this language. And I must tell you, I read this four times, five times, to this moment. I can't believe what I'm reading. May I share this with you? In 1884, that was three years before I was born. In 1884, this man, Byron, writes that his device would improve Bartholomew's stenograph. We'll talk about that later. That was the first most important stenograph machine in the United States, 1882-ish. This would improve Bartholomew's stenograph by attaching to it a transmitter in the electrical combination therewith of a typograph or typewriter at any convenient distance therefrom, which when acting as a <coughs> receiver, will serve to convert the conventional signs into the ordinary letters of the language. Are we not talking real time in 1884? I've read this over and over again, and my interpretation doesn't vary from that. I did mention this briefly before that my 10th epic talks about instant conversion of speech to text. And because this is a shorthand museum, it talks about using, in our case, a stenograph machine, a stenotype device. And I talk about real-time reporting, closed captioning, and card things, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And that is a convenient breaking point if you'd like to do that. We have a lot of things that I'd like to show you, but a shorter amount of time than I thought I was going to have. So, I'm going to be skipping through some of these slides fast, but others I'm going to be spending some time on. What we're now going to talk about is the evolution of the shorthand machine. If this works. While I'm trying to figure out how to get this to work, there is. Um, if we've been distributing some handouts, if you did not receive any, please come up to the front and get some handouts. The descriptions of the gallery and descriptions of the 10 epics of shorthand, which I did promise you earlier. Okay. Um, in, the, in America, most people think that the shorthand machine was invented in America first. And it was not. It was thanks to the Italians that we had the first practical center machine. A man named Antonio Michelezucco made his first prototype in 1851, but he developed his most practical machine in 1863. He introduced it to the Senate, to the legislature in Italy in 1880, where it has been used continuously to this day. Um, he also, in 1888, at 
the Paris World's Fair. And I have a picture of the head of the Statue of Liberty there because that's where the Statue of Liberty was first shown to the world. And that was the actual head that was shipped over to New York ultimately. But at that very same World's Fair is where Mr. McKellar introduced his machine to the world. And in fact, he tried to convince the French that his machine would work well there, but the French did not pick up on that. Ultimately, they invented their own federal machine, but presumably they learned a lot from his. The McKellar machine, here are some models, and again, as you see, I'm going to have to move along a little bit more quickly than I would like. But here are a couple of models which printed to paper tape. And thanks to Fasto Ramondani, we have a couple of models which are completely computerized, recent models. Thank you very much, Fasto, for these pictures. The, Milani, the, the Mr. Milani came along. Um, let me, I have this I have to read. About 100 years after Mr. McKellar's invention, in the early 1960s, Professor Marcello Milani Florence, a scholar and teacher of shorthand, improved on the McKellar shorthand system. Using a slightly modified U.S. stenograph machine, not the McKellar writer, his system capitalized on the structure of the Italian language by having users write words in full, not abbreviated. This created final text with little need for editing. It was in the 1970s that he adapted his system for computer. So I wanted to clarify the difference between the McKellar machine and Milani's version of the system. And if I'm incorrect, Fausto is going to beat me up later. This is something, I'm always discovering new machines. This machine I learned about only last year, actually in an electronics magazine. It was simply called the stenographic machine. It was invented in France. It had 12 black and 12 white keys. They added supplementary signs by using the wrist with those large keys on the side. They claimed the speed of 200 to 250 words per minute. Uh, not too sure, I haven't heard much about that machine. Another machine, the Stenotyper in 1897, was a three pound machine. It was actually made in Germany for the English. Uh, it was the first English language machine and it was able to be used with five different languages. It printed dots and dashes, not letters of the alphabet, but dots and dashes. Um, and there were some schools that were promoted, but little uh, do I know about it after that. This is a machine which uh, has been driving me crazy for years, but I finally put it all together. The Stenophile will be work, and forgive my mispronunciation, please, uh, from France. The inventor is Charles Bivort, and this is an example of how the Stenotype notes look, obviously a French language machine. Another version, a model of the same machine, and once again, a third model. That's why it was driving me crazy. I found all these different models without names, and it took me years to reconcile the fact they were just models, different models of the same machine. In the United States, in 1879, Mr. Bartholomew, remember that uh, patent we discussed before? Mr. Bartholomew invented this machine. Now, he also used dashes. If you look closely, there's a letter R in the beginning, and if you look in the middle of the word stenograph, you'll see another R. It's the same dash. So it's a question of how many characters and what placement. So it was writing actually letters, not sounds, except it did use something for a TH, for example. And that's a very, uh, most people have never seen a printout of what it actually looked like. Uh, a Keogh machine. He, Mr. Keogh had worked for and with Mr. Bartholomew, decided to invent his own machine. This was the last of the non-language, a uh, non-lettered machine, that is, using dashes and dots. Um, he made a lot of exaggerated claims, and uh, his machine, uh, he used pretty well. He was a reporter of, uh, in the House of Representatives in the U.S., uh, but uh, his machine uh, doesn't seem to have gone very far. The Anderson machine was the second most important machine in the United States. It also used corded writing, but it was the first machine to actually use letters. The Anderson map, that's a, a very rare model, but I, I'd like to share that uh, with my audience. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. The French Rangeon machine, there are many different models. 
It started with the direction model and so forth. Um, and uh, many of you, I'm sure, know uh, about the Grand Jean machine. Um, the Revo, which I think is a very pretty machine, I wanted to show that to you. I just love the color of that. I want to show you that because I like what color? Red. That's the color. I call it. That's an example. That's uh, the way the keyboard is laid out on the Grand Jean machine. An example of Steno notes on the Grand Jean machine. I know it's hard to read, and we don't have a lot of time anyway, so we're going to move a little more quickly than ordinarily. The Chambonade Silvatype. Once again, a machine which drove me crazy for years. I thought these were all different machines. It took me a long time to reconcile. This is one machine, different models. Uh, I finally put this all together last year. Once again, a French machine. It printed ordinary characters. The concept was that anybody could read the output. Didn't look like Steno. It was made to work with seven languages. Seven languages. The paper tapes are printed across. They are just laid across this. That you can see that, would, that the output was in different languages. Here's an example of writing on it. I'm only going to read the first two lines with you. Short writing is the indispensable auxiliary. That was the output of that machine. Amazing, isn't it? That period of time. Then came the Ireland stenotype. Anybody here related to Mr. Ireland, Warstone Ireland? Okay, now we can talk. <laughs> Mr. Ireland was a genius. And that's it. He, he invented the washing machine. He invented commercial refrigeration. Mr. Ireland also walked the wire a little bit. For example, when he decided he wanted to invent the steno machine, he spent six years analyzing the English language to decide how to arrange his keyboard. He came up with the tripartite, the three-section uh, keyboard with consonants, vowels, and consonants. And he decided the arrangement of the letters and came to the conclusion that only, for example, the letter S would precede the letter T at the beginning of a word in English. For example. Six years it took him to do this. Okay. <laughs> so he was a genius. But when it came to the mechanics, he bought Bartholomew's machine, he bought Anderson's machine, and he used a lot of things from those machines to invent his own. But he did invent that guy. And he was sued by Mr. Anderson, and Mr. Anderson won the lawsuit. But Mr. Ireland was out of business by the time he, uh, Mr. Anderson could collect, so that just went away. However, just to bring home the point, um, I'm going to very quickly run through these. A couple of pictures of the development of Mr. Ireland's machine. Picture number one, 51 pounds, 54 pounds. Number two, 31 pounds. Number three, 11 and a half pounds. We're getting there. Number four, this is a rare photo. Many people have never seen this photo. Eight and one quarter pounds. He had raised over a million dollars in capital and he began manufacturing in August of 1912. Okay. And of course, that is the final. We're going to move along. During the time that he was not doing well financially, he ultimately closed down, closed shop, but he loved the idea of inventing machines. So he went out and invented this machine, competing company called the National Destroyer Machine. I happened to have acquired one of these less than a year ago. I don't think there were three left in the world. And I was very fortunate to acquire one. Um, and he uses all kinds of novel things I won't go into right now, but it was completely different from his other keyboard. Obviously, it didn't survive very long. Oh, there, there's the keyboard. I forgot that I had that. That's just a quick representation of what it looked like. Um, there was something called the short writer in 1916. The master model three, starting with the Ireland stenotype machine, there was a company called the Stenotype Company, ultimately the LaSalle Stenotype Company, and they made a series of machines. It was kind of a streamlined, uh, the, 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 the stream, the mainstream of, of, of steno machines in the United States. This was their model number three. Um, we'll come back to more of them, because uh, everything here is, is uh, chronological. This is the 1921 Dictotype. Won't talk much about it, just take a quick look at it. The Master Model 4, one of the most pivotal machines in the United States. Again, 
mainline machine, mainframe machine. Um, this is the machine that was used in the very famous Lindbergh trial in the United States in the mid 1930s. Uh, the infant baby of a, a world renowned aviator, Charles Lindbergh, his baby was kidnapped in New Jersey. There was a trial about it. Uh, the trial was United States against, Huff, I'm sorry, New Jersey, the state of New Jersey against Huffman. Huffman was the name of the defendant. And this machine was used. They were producing hourly copy. Um, that is to say, a transcript every couple of hours was being produced, handed to newspapers and so on and so forth. Um, I gave a talk about this machine and talked all about the details of what I would ordinarily spend a lot of time with you about. And after my talk in New Jersey last year, somebody came up to me at the end and said, Don, I want you to know something. In the Hunterdon County Courthouse, the courthouse in which this trial took place, the Lindbergh trial, he said, there's a hole in the floor. I said, so? And he said, no, there was a reason for it. I said, what's the reason? He said, after a while, they wanted this transcript. Remember, before the days of computer, paper tape. Writing the paper tape, people were coming in, ripping off the paper tape, and transcribing throughout the day. Well, they cut a hole in the floor, fit it down through the hole in the floor. People were picking it up from downstairs. Fabulous. I love thinking outside the box. I, didn't, I hadn't known that until then. This is a picture of one of the reporters during the Lindbergh kidnapping trial. And um, you can see the arrow is showing that there's a spare machine there. I wondered why there was a spare machine. And then I read an interview in the mid-1970s of that particular reporter. His name is Walter Hieronymus. And he said the reason that the machine was there is because the machine that they worked on was not a reliable machine. The clutch was unreliable, it was noisy, it was terrible, it would go down and you have to reach over and grab the other machine. That's why he had a spare machine there. Something called the Smith's prototype. Uh, this awkward looking machine was designed by Mr. Hieronymus, who I just spoke about so that the paper would fold toward him so when he had to read back, he just picked it up in front of him instead of reaching far. Something called the Stansky Braille, passed that up by. The Palantite, some of you know better than I do, the English machine, an example of its printout. This is a mach recent uh, machine that I acquired. <coughs> That's the keyboard of the Palantite machine. Recent Palantite models. Something called the reporter, very rare machine. I happen to have two of these, um, but it's a very, very rare machine. And if you take a close look at it, here's the keyboard. It's got three rows of consonants, all five vowels. The inventor was a patent attorney. He said, you know what? It takes too long to learn this battle machine. Put more keys. You'll learn it faster. Yeah, OK. We, we don't have to discuss that any further. Uh, Stenograph Company's first machine in 1939. Uh, the Wrights, Milton Wright and Robert Wright, father and son, were working for the federal type company, making those other machines that I spoke of, and trying to tell the bosses, this ain't cutting it. It's too noisy. The clutch is unreliable. You must improve it. They said, no, no, no. They said, that's it. We can't take any more because it's a federal company. So they started the stenograph company. But what did stenotype then do? They said, wait a minute, what do these guys, these guys do well? So they hired a French designer to design the machine on the left, this slip machine. It was made of cyclic, kind of a rubbery plastic. And they put these racing stripes on it. It was really cool. But when you, as a reporter, took it from the hot to the cold, to the hot and the cold, and you crack. Not so cool. So, again, and there, you know, as a researcher, I, come at, I came up with this um, uh, Master Model 5 in the 1939 and then in 1940, and it took me several years to reconcile that. This is the reason why there was a 1939 model and a 1940 model of the same machine. Okay? Um, you think a job for researchers is easy? Uh, this is one of my favorite design machines, the Brevotype. Very small, very attractive, less than three pounds. Uh, it was meant, made to print English letters. It eliminated the codes and the letter combinations. Uh, let me give you the next slide. That's what the keyboard looked like. Another view of it. It was a small machine. They didn't want to make it a large machine, so they invented a huge, huge cavity of paper you could write for three weeks. 
steady, straight, without a break. <laughs> That's what the center notes look like. And again, it was made to be able to be read by anyone. So, it's hard to read, but from left to right, up uh, top to bottom, Mr. Gray saved ENF, ENF, enough, and -E, e money, to buy a car, and so forth. That was the concept, okay? In Russia, CTM machine, thanks to the Stenograph Corporation, they had this on, on uh, display. They were nice enough to give me some photos that I didn't have. The LaSalle extension machine just was uh, all over the United States. It was sold as part of a correspondence course for many, many years. The similar machine from Germany, I only learned about a couple of years ago, but a beautiful machine also using a tripartite keyboard. Um, I don't know very much about it, but I know that it was invented by a parliamentary reporter in Dusseldorf. That is the layout of the keyboard. Princess Steinle in Germany, Clearotype from France, Stenographs, Square Design. I wish they came up with a better name for it than Square Design, but that's what they call it, the Square Design Machine. Now, there came a time during the Cold War, most of you are too young to even know what that means, I know that, when Russian communications were being intercepted by the United States who was at that point working with IBM. So it was IBM and the United States. The CIA. And they, now that they had this information, and they had interpreters to convert it into English, they wanted it captured in digital text form. So they went to stenograph. And the president of Stenograph was the son of the two founders, uh, Robert Wright, and they said, Robert Wright, what can you do for us? So he took his current machine, the square stenotype machine, he added organ switches from organs, musical instrument, he added those switches to know what keys the reporters were trying to write, he cabled it to a plain old-fashioned, old-fashioned, today's old-fashioned, to a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder sitting on the floor. That was the first computerized machine or system, if you will. The first one and the reason for it. I know you all wanted to know that. I had to share that with you. And so we continue. That began uh, Stanograph Company's uh, series of uh, stenotype writers, and uh, their, this, their, this is a couple of their early ones. There was a machine called the Steno Print made by a company called Edmund, H-E-D-M-A-N, who initially made the first Stenograph machine. Uh, Stenograph's curved machine design. This, I'm sorry, it's a poor, poor picture. I really don't have a better picture, so if anybody has anyone, anything to share with me, I'd appreciate it. This is the Steno Key in Bulgaria. Quick story, one of my office mates a long time ago, his name is Jerry Collin. He was in the United Nations, stationed in Bulgaria. He was asked by some representatives of the Bulgarian government to give a, I'm sorry, I'm talking so quickly. I'm truly sorry. Um, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm truly sorry about that. Dan, I'm doing it just because it's you and only you can report this. Um, <laughs> are they marvelous? Are they great? Um, Jerry, was asked to give a demonstration. He did. The Bulgarians came up with this machine, which was, if I understand correctly, cabled to a, an IBM Selectric typewriter in an adjoining room that was so loud. But they were actually pretty much writing real time. They were writing pieces of words, as I understand it, pieces of words in real time. And someone told me that they were also translating it into another language. I'm not too sure of that, but that's what I've heard. Um, so the uh, Baron uh, Company, Baron Data Company, that was their, their first major uh, impact in the United States called the Steno Converter. Some of their later models. This is the x machine, some of its later models. Another x machine. And this was interesting because it incorporated a keyboard so that if you were out working and you had a couple of minutes to transcribe, you could do the editing right there. Just flip a tap, the, the top open on your center machine and start doing some editing. So heavy. Oh, you needed a mule to carry it around. Um, the Smart Rider, which was very, very popular for very many years in the United States. 
Uh, the micrograph is a machine that I had bought early on, and that is not so much for the micrograph itself, but to be illustrative of the fact that at about this time, the late 1980s, there was a proliferation. A number of companies were coming up with their own machines. They would go to Stenograph or some of the other uh, manufacturers and say, look, we want to buy your machine. We want to add the electronics our own way. So in this case, they used something. I know it's not called a wafer tape, but it was a very small uh, cassette tape that, that he used to capture uh, his, uh, his, 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 the reporter's writing. Uh, the person who invented this machine today owns Eclipse. Same person. Now, I know John will beat me up if he's here. I hope he's not here. Um, this is the first real-time writer called the Digitext. Jerry Leffler is the name of the reporter from Houston, as I recall. Um, Jerry was uh, the reporter consultant on the team, or the reporter part of the group. Um, and I was invited, oh, I guess around maybe 1985, down to Lower Manhattan one day, somebody called me and said, uh, Don, we want you to come down to see this brand new thing. And I saw this man sitting at his metal machine with this big screen in front of him like this, and he's writing, and all these words are coming up in English, and I said, that's impossible. The beginnings of real time. I said, how can anybody do this? Now, Jerry was also a speed contest writer, but he did. Great, great little machine. Uh, unfortunately, we kind of you had to learn a, 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 a restrictive uh, system, and it did not give a lot of room for flexibility. And so it was good for a while, but it really never took uh, for us uh, didn't really to capture the market in any major way. These are some of his later machines. These are all outgrowths of the Steno um, of the Digitext. Zappy writer, Impact writer. Phonics writer. In fact, the last three, Jerry was in touch with me. I had been looking for him for years, couldn't find him. Somebody who came across the gallery put him in touch with me. He sent me the last three machines. So I have them in the role of the gallery displayed today. Pro model. This is, I invented, I came up with a new category of machine. Because things were changing in the industry. So I came up with what I called the paperless, what do I call them? Um, keyboard input machines. And the concept was, I wanted to tell the world, this is a category of machine which has no practical onboard, self-contained readback capability. It doesn't print the paper, it doesn't have a large screen. You have to have some external device to read back to see what you're writing. And so the first one was the Pro Model by Stanograph. It actually was a student machine. The next one was the Gemini, which is now called the Infinity, uh, the Trial, and there are others as well, but those are the three key ones. The Centura came about in 1992, and the Yahweh Stenotype in 1994. Um, in 2007, I was fortunate to have been in Beijing, as I mentioned, I think, earlier, as part of a group. It turned out that I had sent over in advance a, an Ireland machine. I owned a couple of them. And I sent one over so that we could, as a group, present it to our Chinese counterparts just as a token of, of, of good, good faith. And um, the morning, one morning I was told by our group leader, Dong, the inventor of Mr. Tang Yahweh is going to be there. I think he was 92 or 94 years of age at the time. And she said, please, it's your machine you presented to him. And so that's on the left, a picture of my presenting to Tang Yahweh, the Ireland Stenal machine. Two days later, Kelly Yang, Tang Kelly Yang, had somebody call us and say, we want to make a presentation to Don in the Marriott, Beijing Marriott. And so this is his presenting the center machine from China to me. And that center machine obviously has a very exclusive place within the gallery today. Uh, this is what I know of the Korean Kazuin machine. I do not know an awful lot about it, but I hope that I can find out more this week. The Stenograph's mirror machine came about in 2003. They have a series of them, the mirror, the fusions, uh, some of the paper, without paper, and so forth. Um, brilliant machine. Stenovations, Digitouch. Take a look at that. A lot of people are not even aware of this machine. That was a brilliant invention of Johnny Jackson. 
Um, the concept of that machine was, reporter, you buy a machine. When you get it, you take your hands and find the normal placement of your hands. Everybody's hands are different. Find what's comfortable for you. Take them, place it on our tablet, if you will, and then press down for X number of seconds. That is your home position. Ever hear of the iPad? Johnny made a lot of money on his pen because the iPad is based on his invention. So that was Johnny's invention, brilliant man. And of course, uh, today's machine that he uh, markets is called the Lightspeed. Uh, Mark Kisinger uses that. By the way, in case you don't know that, next month, a world's first attempt is going to be made in the United States in Nashville at the NCRA convention. I think it's six writers will attempt to write <coughs> A roll. 400 words per minute for one minute. I think one of those reporters is here. I think D is one of the contestants. Um, the concept I'm pretty sure is Mark Kisningberry's. Uh, Mark and I have become pretty friendly in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, just wanted to mention to you, you know, when you start talking about six plus words per second, not even talking about finger speed. I've done fast speeds. I still have a 300 word a minute record. That's fast. Six, six and a half words per second. You're talking about almost musical speeds, speeds of musicians. That's pretty fast. Just to have the concentration to do that. Anyway, just thought I'd mention that to you. And of course, uh, today's, uh, one of today's more, more advanced machines, the color, I love the color, the Diamante. And that's really about all that I have to tell you. Of course, we have keyboards in different languages, and did I meet my time goal? Uh, no, I guess I did, sorry about that. I did my best. Thank you very much. Dear Dominic, thank you for this overwhelming presentation. I, I no doubt I can tell you that it was the most lively presentation we ever had in the IPRS meetings. And that's a big compliment. Thanks a lot for your very interesting